two, one. Two. All right. All righty, folks. I believe we're live. If you can see us live, go ahead and comment. Go ahead and comment in the chat on YouTube if you can see us live. So we are getting started now with our program today. Thank you all for being here so, so much. This is a AAM program. Um, greetings, animal allies. Welcome to another AAM program designed to help you become a more knowledgeable, effective, and outspoken advocate for the animals. Today, I'm speaking with lawyer and author Jim Mason, who, co who wrote the classic expose, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature. Here it is. And co-authored Animal Factories with Peter Singer. Our talk with Jim will attempt to cover many important topics and offer strategies for how we can overcome speciesism, human elitism, or supremacy, and dominionism. Jim will answer your questions. Hold on, sorry there, folks. I know I just got muted. Um, my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. AAM is a multinational program supporting seasoned as well as new fledgling activists. Our mission is to empower activists to reach their full potential and equip them with the tools, community, and resources they need to boldly participate in our global animal liberation movement. Founded in 2020, AAM offers a free three-month mentorship program, which pairs experienced activists with aspiring activists. Additionally, we offer free educational online programs like this one. We have a podcast called the Animal Liberation Hour, and we host large-scale in-person activism events around the country. If you're interested in applying to become a mentor or mentee or want to get involved, or to donate, please visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com, or find us on Patreon as well. All right, so now we are going to get started. And I will, you know, do my best to monitor the chat here and relay your questions to Jim. Uh, reminder, please keep your comments kind and respectful and your questions on topic as much as you can. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Jim Mason. Hey, Jim. Hi, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You've been with us before. This is like our fourth time that we've talked with you. And it's been a pleasure each and every time and each and every time you're so enlightening and have so much knowledge to share so much history to share so much experience to share. So I'm glad that you're with us today. Let's just start then for those who might not know who you are and the role you've played in our movement. Um, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself and how long you've been doing this? Um, and then we'll go to our topic and our main message today. Sure. Thanks. Well, um, <laughs> as you can tell by looking at me, I'm <laughs> quite old. Uh, I got involved first in the New York City area in 1972-73 with a group called Friends of Animals. And um, at the time, the uh, founder and president, Alice Harrington, sort of ushered me into animal activism. And I started off really um, doing research for her into laws protecting animals, trying to pass legislation, this and that. And... Um, out of the blue one day, she asked me if I would write a pamphlet or a little booklet about factory farming, about which no one knew anything. I was still eating <laughs> eating meat at the time, <laughs> along with every other activist I knew. We weren't vegetarians or vegans yet. We were interested in uh, wildlife and extinction and things like that. So... Alice had me start looking into factory farming, and it re resulted in this pamphlet, which uh, I don't know if there's any copies anywhere, but 
that really opened my eyes to animal agriculture. And about the same time that I was writing the booklet, we found that Peter Singer was teaching a course at New York University. And um, Alice said, we've got to meet this guy. <laughs> she said it just like that. She said <laughs> with a cigarette in her mouth and a glass of gin in the other. And she says, we got to meet this guy. <laughs> so we went to lunch and we discovered that Peter was working on a book and he was writing a chapter on factory farming. And I was already writing about that. So we joined forces. And within a few years, we decided that the chapter he did in Animal Liberation needed to be turned into a whole book that factory farming was a huge subject. And it was Peter's idea that we use lots of photographs. He says, if we don't show pictures of these places and the insides of the animals in cages and stalls and pens um, wallowing in their own waste, people won't believe it. So that's how we started working on the book, uh, it became Animal Factories, which came out in 1980. And... Um, that's so long ago that it's almost forgotten now, but I believe, and I've checked with people, I think that was the first very broad, wide public exposure of the scenes of factory farming. Um, Peter had a couple of photographs in Animal Liberation, which I went with him and we took those pictures uh, that you saw in Animal Liberation. I think it was a veal farm and a, a battery egg uh, cage layer facility but then when we did animal factories um i traveled for two months uh, i think we drove over ten thousand miles i uh, went to just about every state in the eastern part of the united states taking pictures of factory farms of the interiors of every species uh, cattle dairy cattle beef cattle um, pigs chickens layer chickens egg chickens meat chickens broilers, everything, turkeys and veal calves. And that became the book Animal Factories. And it caused a bit of a splash. It's kind of forgotten now. It did get a lot of attention. Um, my first big television appearance was on uh, NBC Today Show, which at that time, this was before cable and the internet, 1980. And uh, NBC's Today was the big, big audience morning talk show. And um, I was on and I showed slides, I don't know, five or six or seven scenes of the insides of factory farms. And they were pretty shocking. Um, and then, of course, that book, uh, Animal Factories, got reviewed in some of the major papers, including the Washington Post, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Chicago Sun-Times, some big press coverage, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times. So I think it made quite an impression. Um, at the time, and um, and we brought up uh, the animal welfare issues along with the other problems with factory farming because we're dealing with basically a meat-eating audience. We wanted to show them how bad factory farming is for the food system, about the drugs and the chemicals and the poor health of the animals and antibiotics and all of that, and of course, the impact on the environment. Uh, and we had no idea at the time how big that was. And since that time, since 1980, so much more information has come out about the impacts of animal agriculture. So now that I sit here and talk about this, my only regret is that we didn't know about the more recent information about animal agriculture's impact on climate change and climate crisis so mm. it uh, was really quite a quite a production so i've been an, uh, a student of uh, farm animal issues ever since animal agriculture being kind of like my revenge because i was raised on an, a family farm and uh, some know that uh, in my childhood i had to participate in some pretty mm. unpleasant and cruel activities um, with animals. So in um, in my, my grief, my remorse, my regret over that ex those experiences, I've devoted most of my life now to exposing what I, I think we all know are the evils 
of exploitation of animals, especially for food. It's the biggest cruelty on the planet. Nothing comes close in terms of the numbers of animals affected. Quality and quantity, yeah. Yeah. So with that in mind, ah, Michelle. Oh, <laughs> no, it, it all, I mean, I, you know, yeah. I wish we didn't have to talk about this at all, right? But, but gets, we are, but. <laughs> yeah, it's it gets uh, dark and unpleasant, and we'll try to avoid, you know, too many details about the cruelties, I think. Maybe their yeah. listeners, their viewers are familiar with all that. And we just have to become vegans. You know, we have to. We have to channel that heaviness, that anger, that sad, right. that we hopelessness. Do. We have to channel it into hope and into action. And what you said, you know, reminds me how important photography and video are, you know, and, and how much more, you know, undercover footage there is now because of phones being cameras yeah. as well. And I also just want to thank you for the legacy. However, you know, you're going to leave with us to be the the first, the first to really put it out there and it's out there forever. Um, and I don't know if anybody who's watching this live has a copy of Animal Liberation or any of Jim's other books, or if you remember reading it and how it impacted you, you're welcome to share that in the chat, you know, we certainly would like to know that. So let's dive in. God, we could go in so many directions, but I know, Jim, we were yeah. talking about that. But let's dive into the topic, you know, and, and explaining what human supremacy or human elitism is also called. It's called a, a few different things, speciesism, um, you know, as it relates to animal exploitation and why it's urgent to understand what it is and urgent to act. So, so help us understand this. Yeah, it's um, it's a big, big, deep subject, and uh, any of the viewers uh, feel like we're getting too intellectual and historical and too much academic um, stuff that's too seems too remote from the problem of the cruelty to animals. Uh, just break in and and ask us a question. But uh, Michelle and I have talked about this. Uh, off and on for months, and we feel like it's important for activists to really know the history of how we came to exploit animals when you created the set of ideas, the ideology, the ideology of speciesism. Uh, we've been calling it speciesism in the movement for years, but it's kind of too mild a word, I think. Um, it's... Uh, it's kind of like uh, when we talk about sexism, um, discrimination against uh, women and girls. Um, it's worse than that. It's a uh, stronger word is misogyny. It's uh, an active negative attitude, hatred, contempt uh, to diminish these beings by in, uh, by maintaining insults and demeaning. Um, ideas about them. That's what misogyny is. It's kind of like um, uh, uh, sexism on steroids, really. It uh, makes women into inferior creatures uh, worthy of hatred and contempt. Well, it came up with a similar word for speciesism, which to me seems kind of mild, because it's worse than that. It's uh, hate and contempt and um, treating animals as uh, unworthy of any kind of moral consideration uh, beneath us. Yeah. And um, the best example I can think of of this attitude toward it, this hateful attitude, and I had to coin a word for it, it's similar to misogyny, I call it misothry. It's hatred and contempt for animals. And the best expression I can think of is when, when there is um, a spectacular crime of sorts of like uh, brutal murders, uh, multiple murders, uh, child murder and rape. When it's covered in the press, they call the perpetrators animals, which is the classic example of using animals as inferior, hateful, contemptible beings to describe some kind of human behavior. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about. You call it speciesism. We also call it misothery, hatred and contempt for animals. And um, Mich Michelle has framed this discussion in terms of human supremacy. 
And it's an attitude that we are special. Uh, we are not animals. Animals are beneath us. They're put here for us to use and to exploit and do whatever we want with them. And uh, another term that we've used in the movement for years is the we fight cruelty. Well, cruelty is real and it exists and it's terrible. But as long as we just frame our program, our movement as fighting cruelty, uh, we're not really dealing with the magnitude of it because cruelty is kind of a mixed word. It has a lot of different meanings to different people. And I don't want to overly intellectualize this, but in some quarters of our economy, um, what we would consider cruel to animals, the industries that do these things don't consider it cruelty. They consider it necessary. For example, in the laboratories, they do unspeakable things to animals and in the name of science and knowledge and inquiry, and they don't consider it cruel to strap a monkey into a immobilization device and, you know, and pick its brain apart. Or in the case of factory farming, to keep pigs in crates where they can't even turn around and where they're going to be slaughtered and dismembered. Um, so that's cruel, no doubt about it. But if we just attack it as cruelty, um, a lot of people don't see it that way. So they don't know why we're bothering. Why do we have a movement to abolish something that they don't even think is wrong? So we have to go bigger than that and we have to go deeper. And that's why we talk about this idea of human supremacy, which is also human exceptionalism, which is we're not animals. They are animals and we're not. So that's human exceptionalism. So these are all the things that we need to talk about as a movement and um, to add some of this these ideas uh, to your activism. And then I hope with activism, activists today being innovative and and uh, inventive, maybe some of these ideas can be turned into activism of a kind to show society why we do what we do. Uh, our movement, you know, has has been ridiculed over the years. And some of you who are as old as I am will remember back in the day, most of society sort of made fun of animal groups. They thought, why are these people caring about cats and dogs? when there are children starving and people suffering around the world, uh, they didn't see, they didn't take us seriously. They didn't think we had anything of value to add to society, to civilization. Then the animal rights co movement comes along in the late seventies and the eighties. And we have a whole new breed of animal groups who are really activists for animal rights as opposed to animal welfare. The difference being that animal rights people animal freedom people don't support animal exploitation of any kind. We're vegan. We want to abolish the exploitation of animals. We want to recognize our kinship, our brotherhood and sisterhood with other animals with whom we share the planet. And we want to learn to identify with all of that in a sense of kinship with the other life here so that we can have a better life for everyone on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, thank you for framing it in in that way, and and you're reminding me of how important language is as well. You know, how important you think it is to try to use non-speciesist language when we talk to people, and not to use those phrases sure. that yeah. objectify or you know make abstractions of animals. Yes, that's a good point because I was brought up. Uh, until recently, we used the word, the pronoun it for animals. <laughs> we didn't identify the gender of animals where the dairy cow is a she, you know, and, and so forth. And so that's been a change in, in language. Now, you framed this, um, this session by talking about dismantling human supremacy. We should talk about the word dismantling. That is another word for taking things apart, isn't it? Like when we dismantle a car or dismantle a toy or dismantle a house, we take it apart and then we find out how it was constructed. 
dismantle means to explore the makings of something. And that's why I've written this book about the makings mm. of the ideology and ideology and culture that entitles us to exploit animals. Now, this may get a little super intellectual for you, so break in if you want to, and you'll say, what does this have to do with activism? I think it helps us understand the magnitude of what we're up against and the depth of it, not only historically, but economically. We are going against probably the biggest industry in the world, which is the animal agriculture complex, which is not just pig farms and dairy farms and chicken farms. It includes another huge sector of the economy, the drug and pharmaceutical business. Today, animal agriculture is almost like a joined at the hip with the, with the industries that produce drugs, chemicals, and antibiotics. That's huge. You have no idea. <laughs> it's almost scary to think of what huge industries they are, what a huge chunk of the economy, the world economy that these industries are. And that's what we're taking on. But don't be scared. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. Because it's... Even in Goliath, right? <laughs> it is coming apart in front of our eyes. In recent years, I'm so delighted and encouraged and empowered by the information that's come about, uh, that's come to us in the mainstream media now about the impacts of animal agriculture and about the uh, impacts of uh, having a constant stream of unpronounceable chemicals and drugs in our diet and in our bodies and in our environment, microplastics everywhere. This is all a part of what we're up against. And sometimes it seems so big and so powerful and so overwhelming that we think, oh, we can't do this. Yes, we can. We're doing it. It's happening. Attitudes towards animals are changing under our noses. And I tell you that from experience, the 50 years of activism was starting out in a time when none of the animal groups even knew about factory farming. None of them even knew about animal liberation or animal rights. They were still basically fundraising off of cruelties to dogs and cats and the occasional mention of vivisection and not much more. So we're a bigger movement. We have deeper roots and we see a bigger picture now of what we're going to have to do, which is undo some things. Yeah. Oh, this is so great. You've said so much there. And, um, but there was a question in the chat. So bringing us a little bit back to language Yes. Uh, a little bit, which is, um, are these terms entirely interchangeable or is there one that is more all encompassing and fundamental? Yeah. Well, we use a lot of different terms when we talk about animals. Now, we've been used to, uh, for years, using the expression other animals, which implies that, yes, we're animals too, but we're talking about the animals are not like us. And we use the word non-human animals. And these are okay. I mean, they're already in print everywhere. Um, non-human kind of bothers me a little bit because it has a negative about it, like non being not, and human is sort of being the standard, you know, like the word human is associated with humane and humanity and nice, good things. So when we call animals, other animals, non-human, to me, that sort of makes them negative because they're not human. I like to use the word um, animal cousins or, or mm. fellow animals so that we feel a sense of continuity, which is real. We're not talking about some mystery here. <laughs> We're mammals. Let's face it. We evolved from ape-like creatures. Well, some would say we, <laughs> we haven't evolved that much. We've got a long way to go to be fully human. But uh, yeah, so we have a lot of issues with terminology. How do we refer to our brothers and sisters, our cousin, the other animals, the non-human animals? So that's under discussion at all times. And they use the proper pronouns when we call a dairy cow an it. A dairy cow is a she. It's a female mammal and so on and so forth. So we're doing that. That's part of our movement now. 
What do you feel about, you know, as activists, when we're doing outreach, um, pointing out euphemisms as well? Would you recommend, like people use even the word hamburger, the word bacon, the word meat? Right. They're all euphemisms. I mean, do you, what do you, what do you say? Do you say flesh? Yeah. <laughs> do you say corpse? Do you say cadaver? Do you just say dead animal? I mean, body what, parts. <laughs> body parts. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always delighted to piss off my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> non-vegan friends and family by I like how you say that delighted to piss off <laughs> well, I, had, yeah. I had an experience recently with somebody was boasting about a wonderful ribeye steak and i said well that's actually a muscle out of the back of of a cow or a steer it's uh it's has a long name a long decimus long decimus dorsi i think it is a special part of this animal's body that helps keep it stand up on four legs. And we've taken that out of that. And we've killed it, dismembered it, cut it into pieces. And we call this special muscle. And you could go on and on with this. Uh, you could really describe it. You could. I, uh, right. And, and I that... try to. Yeah. I, I think it, maybe sometimes you have to be kind of careful of company. You're sure, with. Of course. If you, <laughs> you might get thrown out of a restaurant if you did it, but uh, I think it's important to do that, to make them identify that they're eating a body part of an animal that was killed for their pleasure. Yeah, connect it back to the animal. Get them visualizing what you're saying. If you're yeah. graphic, not graphic enough, but if you're compelling enough and descriptive enough and emotive enough, they'll start to see the cow that they're eating and they'll start to make that connection because the problem is that people are so disconnected and there's all yes. that cognitive dissonance and there's the fact that it's so ubiquitous and this is an invisible eating animals is an invisible you know belief system that we're all born into you know but but pointing out the grossness you know you're just stating the facts when well when carol adams calls that the absent referent which is that that animal body part that's on our plate is not the animal is absent from that it's been it's been killed and dismembered but we don't like to think about that. So we call it a ribeye or a prime rib or something. Yeah, that's part of our, I think, is our job. It's called honesty. That's what it's called. It's just being honest. Honesty, transparency. What a. We don't have to buy into their euphemisms, which help them insulate emotionally from the damage and the violence that they've done to animals for, for their taste, for their pleasure. And they don't like it when we do that. That, that's why vegans are often unpopular in, in mainstream society because we do these things. We remind them, we break down that cognitive dissonance, that separation of the animal from the food. And that's what we, that's part of our job. And that's part of dismantling human supremacy, Absolutely. making them aware. Dismantling it from the top down or from the bottom up, however we can do it, you know, yeah, and, and it it does require us to be bold and sometimes and not be shy and all of that to remind people that animals are not food. It 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 makes them just sort of it confuses them at first. But but talk about because you and I were talking about again being vegan. Why be, being vegan is activism? Like why must we be vegan and why is being vegan not enough? Well, first of all, for our own spiritual i suppose emotional integrity we we can't be authentic activists serious if we're still quote unquote enjoying animal products we don't enjoy them so we show the world that we don't enjoy them we are not part of that matrix anymore we've departed <laughs> we've left that behind and we're trying to explain to people you can do this too it's not hard. And when you do it, it will help you change your thinking about animals. And this is a particularly timely and appropriate these days because we're in, in a climate crisis. We're in a state of human exploitation on the planet. What is it? Over 8 billion people. It seems like all of whom want to live like Americans and have too many cars and clothes and throw away 40% of all the food produced. The whole world is basically gobbling up the planet and the effects of it are becoming known in the climate crisis. 
And in order to stop this, we have to reconsider the way we've related to what we call nature, which I call the living world, which is all that living stuff out there, those things, those animals, those plants. That's the world that we've always been brought up to exploit and use as we see fit. The idea which we get not only from the Bible, but we got it from the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians and all of our antecedent cultural ancestors had the same idea of human supremacy. That any of you went to college and studied philosophy, you may have read Aristotle. Oh, Aristotle. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't into Judaism. He was a, he was a, a what's the word for their, their belief system? It was not the theism that we know, not the religion that we know. They, they respected the gods and they had many of them. But Aristotle argued that man was supreme that everything existed for the sake of man. That was the word he used, meaning humans, which is pretty much the same mentality as that expressed in in the Bible, which is God created everything for us to use. These are some of the the building blocks of human supremacy, whether you look to the Bible or the Quran or any other um, religious text, it, it expresses the view that we're supreme, we're entitled to everything. And the Greeks and the Romans had the same attitude. So this is this is our Western culture. The Western culture is built on the precept and the ideology, the ideology that humans are special and they're entitled to do everything they want. So this is relevant now that we're in a climate crisis and we're trying to stop gobbling up the planet, trying to reverse climate change trying to reduce our impacts on the world, trying to reduce our numbers and our consumption. So the animal issue is right in the middle of that, because as we change our attitudes about animals, we're going all the way and changing our attitudes about the living world of which animals are the main characters. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so we're part of a pretty big movement, actually. So <laughs> when you feel too little and too weak and that we're not getting anywhere, we really are part of a major change that's going on during our lifetimes. And um, it's accelerating. Mm. There's more awareness of the climate crisis. There's a lot more awareness, not just in academia, but in the mainstream media about attitudes about the world, the living world, they have to change because we can't keep up this direction. Yeah. So you're part of that. So be hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and thank you for pointing out again, you know, the big, again, the bigger picture, we keep going to the bigger picture and maybe back to the smaller picture, which is what we can do every day, but pointing out the intersection between veganism and animal exploitation and climate crisis. And for me, there's also an overlap between that. And like, for me, I try to be a minimalist. That's my everyday contribution. I could try to use less plastic every day or not not consume, not buy, keep buying things, you know, because all that is contributing to the overall, you know, condition of our world as well. Yes. And when you think of it on that scale, as we just did, the magnitude of it seems overwhelming. Don't be overwhelmed. You can't be an effective activist if you don't feel your power. And the change that is happening as we speak, maybe you don't see it hour by hour, day by day. But I can tell you from my experience, I've seen a a quantum shift in our attitudes about many animals, especially those that we're close to. Attitudes about wildlife have changed. Uh, there's much more protection of endangered species now than there was 50 years ago. Um, attitudes about pets. When I got into the movement in the early 70s, animal welfare groups were killing. They called it putting to sleep, euthanizing. That's not the word. They were killing 25 to 30 million animals a year simply because nobody wanted them. Now, we've made some changes in that so that today with more spaying and neutering more adoptions more rescue we've reduced those numbers substantially that is a big success 
and that's but that only applies to dog and cat dogs and cats and the familiar pet animals so we did make a difference and we're still doing it it's it's going to it's going to get better thank you because uh, we we did call this program a hopeful a hopeful conversation <laughs> which it is, is. So we could keep, want to keep steering you know in that duration it's like yes this is what it is and we can be hopeful in this way so we're getting some good dialogue going on in the chat yeah. Jim, and people are uh, some want you to talk a little bit about but i have a question for you first about the relationship between more about spirituality and religion as it relates to, you know, the roots of uh, animal exploitation and, and I guess how we can harness those conversations for good, you know, um, as well. Um, but I don't know if you can comment on, you know, the impact of, of course, our food choices on animals we're talking about, but also the psychological and societal impact you know, normalized violence leads to a violent society. Sure, sure. Yes, I, one of the things I've written about and think about a lot is how this almost solid, except for us vegans, this sort of solid mainstream acceptance of the industrialization of raising and killing and dismembering animals for the food chain. What is that doing to what we... <laughs> used to call humanity. I don't see how the human species can, consider, can even think of itself as a compassionate being if it does this as a matter of course, without any compunction, without any concern whatsoever. Our distant ancestors, when they were hunters and gatherers back in the Paleolithic era, they at least had some spiritual ideas about animals that they had to perform rituals and ceremonies in order to go out on the hunt. They had some emotional connection with animals, emotional, spiritual connection that they had to deal with in order to kill animals to bring them back and, and eat them. We don't have that anymore. We just We have an industry that does that. It's mindless, it's heartless, it's uh, mechanical, it's uh, it's insulated us, or those who eat those products, insulated them from the horror of it. And um, I think part of our job as activists is to bring that horror home to them. And um, and you know how difficult that can be sometimes. You you will be unpopular, and uh, you need to try to find a way to bring this information to them somehow humanely and gently so that you don't just uh, break off relationships with people. You can let them know about this where they want to ignore it, deny it, distance themselves from it. That's what we do as activists. We bring that, that, that complex, that industrial complex to their awareness so that they know what they're doing. Yeah. That's part of dismantling is to interfere with that cognitive dissonance that they that 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 distancing that they do so that they can enjoy the taste of that ribeye steak. Yeah. So we're open to any other questions. If I've missed any questions, um, forgive me. Go ahead and put them in again if you still have questions or or comment or something you would like me to relay to Jim. Uh, now, because we can go in so many, uh, you know, different directions with this. So um, um, Miriam is commenting there are vegan species as too. So in a way, we can't use that word. Um, I don't really like to equate humans with being animals because animals are better than us. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Interesting, right? So yeah. let's talk, you know, we'll, we're going to look for, I'm watching for some more questions, but you know, talk about um, our movement. We were talking about that you believed that we need to be strategic in our movement, even more strategic, not just organized, but we need to be strategic, maybe more globally cohesive and collaborating um, in order in order to be successful. Yes, and how? How can we, you know, begin to do that? And what are you seeing? Is I think you you see that happening? Sure, I think. 
the, the activists who might be um, joining us in the session may or may not be aware that uh, there are animal activist groups uh, all over Europe and all the major countries. Uh, it's not just a handful of us here in the United States. Um, there's really significant activism against the exploitation of animals in all the European countries and and even uh, Latin American countries and companies, uh, countries that you probably wouldn't imagine. Um, I, I'm not in touch uh, personally with a lot of those groups, but um, if you were a member of PETA or some of the other major animal welfare groups, they have, they would surely have information about uh, brother and sister organizations doing some of the same thing. So you are a part of what is an international movement to raise awareness about animal exploitation. So um, feel that power, that membership in, in a huge effort. Uh, so don't feel intimidated by the magnitude of the industries that we're tackling. They're already weakening. They're getting nervous about it. As you may know, mm -hmm. those of you who use oat milk and soy milk and other milks, plant-based foods, that's uh, rattled the cage of animal agriculture. There, we struck a nerve there. We've shown that there are alternatives, tasty, satisfying, nutritious alternatives to their body parts of animals. And we don't have to buy that stuff anymore. And this is uh, kind of unsettling for them because of course this is the basis of entire industries and profits. So um, the more we do that, the more we promote vegan products and vegan choices, the more we rattle their cage. So that's a big part of dismantling the, uh, let's just call them the enemy because they are the enemy because of the things they're doing to our brothers and sisters, animals. Are you, are you more hopeful about the dismantling of dairy industry? I know that dairy and meat industries really are overlapping, really are one and the same, but are you more hopeful about dairy going first potentially? Uh, Dairy is dairy's already underway, and it's a pretty easy one because there are so many kinds of plant-based, quote-unquote, milks. And uh, you may know that it annoys them, bothers them terribly that we're using the word milk because they want to own the word milk, is only that uh, coming from a cow, uh, a bovine. So, yeah, we, we've got their attention by uh, promoting it. And, of course, the market for the plant-based alternatives is overtaking their their market, uh, and uh, that bothers them a lot. And the dairy industry is uh, one of the most vulnerable. They're weakened. Um, every year, they have fewer cows producing a large volume of milk. Uh, they really are milking them to death. Um, it used to be the milk and the cheese was produced by thousands and thousands of small farms, the kind that I was brought up on. We had I think at the most we had 14 cows and they all had names and they all went out to pasture every day. And, you know, they weren't stuck in a stall their entire life. And we didn't kill them after they were three or four years old either. Um, but that doesn't make it nice. That just, it's just the way it was back then. But all of that part of the dairy industry has been replaced by factory farms where they have thousands and thousands of cows and they're milked around the clock and the calves are just discarded as, you know, waste products. So yeah, the dairy industry, I believe is the most vulnerable and the alternatives, the plant-based alternatives are the most um, viable and making the best uh, record in the market. And uh, I think the, the only thing that needs more development and it's happening is the dairy byproducts in the form of ice cream and cheese and all the other things that come from milk. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's hopeful. That's all hopeful. And you're right. We're seeing that every day and uh, we are upsetting people and that means we're doing our job and we're getting people talking. So <laughs> some of the comments right now are around, we're still, are still talking a little bit about language and all of that. Well, how, yes. what we should call ourselves. Um, I don't equate uh, I said that non-human animal is not problematic unless people choose to use it in a demeaning way. My favorite way to describe our brothers and sisters or cousins or people because they have personhood. I like that. Um, yes. 
And I, uh, Hannah Moon Vegan says she really likes people of other species a lot. So people have their favorite terms and what resonates yeah, for them. Sure. Yeah. You know? So uh, good. Be Vegan says non-human well, non -human is problematic just as referring to a person of color as non-white or a female as non-male. It frames the dominant at the forefront and further yes. marginalizes the already marginalized. I know right. I agree with that. That's a that's a great way of saying it. That's excellent. Um, yeah, that's my thinking. I, I don't want to make too much of the terminology thing because as everybody knows, animal activists tend to fuss and fight with each other a lot, which is something we need to address. We're always like getting you know, our back up about somebody uses the wrong word or this or that. So um, go gently into this area and uh, just don't try to kill each other over somebody using the wrong name like some do with pronouns today. Just go easy. Yeah. And we're working this out. It's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, again, I want to, you know, point out your book and hope people, which came out in, in the eighties or nineties. There's a, it first came out uh, 93, but it's been revised and updated. And there's a, uh, a 2021 version, the updated edition of 2021 from Lantern Books. And I think you've, here's what the new cover looks like. I don't, it's about the same as the one close, you Close, close, but, but yeah, but now you can see difference, yeah. a difference, a different photo of a different chimpanzee. Yeah. 20, 2021 was the expanded, updated new version that has some new material and some new, uh, an excellent, um, I think, um, introduction or, or preface, which explains what I've tried to explain so far, that the animal issue is very much a part of the whole look at what we're doing to the, to the planet and to the environment. And climate crisis focuses mm. our attention upon the worldview that we've inherited, which tells us we're special. Everything is here is a resource for us. We're reviewing and analyzing that way of seeing nature. And um, in the book, The Revision, uh, explains that a little more important, like why it's relevant to consider, to reconsider attitudes towards animals. And uh, one of the, on that note, I just thought of something that helped me a lot when I was writing the book, because I had to read a lot about pre-agricultural societies, Paleolithic, Stone Age, hunter-gatherer um, societies and cultures. And even though they killed animals and ate them, although not nearly as much as you hear about in the mainstream press, there were more or less uh, vegan uh, societies and vegetarian societies, fruits and nuts and berries and so forth. It, not everybody killed animals to survive. And those that did, didn't make a daily diet of it. But what I'm getting at is they had a sense of kinship with other animals. And for those of you who have studied any anthropology or that part of prehistory, uh, they called it totemism. And you know the word totem pole, which is a carving of animal heads and so forth. Uh, before agriculture, people, they didn't worship animals. They admired other animals. Other animals had powers, capacities, activities that humans admired. And I often think of the quote by the great art historian, Sir Kenneth Clark wrote a book about animals, animals and art. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just the best expression of how these Paleolithic people related to other animals. And he was talking about the cave paintings, the very first art in human history, it was paintings on the walls of these caves in Spain and in France and possibly other places that haven't been discovered yet. They painted those animals, Clark says, because they admired them. He said, he wrote, I wish I had the text in front of me. He said, what they were thinking as they drew those images of these powerful animals, they were saying, these are the most admirable of our fellow beings. 
These are our ancestors that we most admire. These are what we want to be like because these animals had powers that humans did not. They could not outrun a lion or a leopard or a bear. They could not run as fast as a bison or an antelope or a gazelle. Animals did things that puzzled humans, made them think about the life they were seeing, the animal life. But it was a way of relating to those animals because they could see things about them that were more powerful than them <sighs> and admirable. And they wanted that. They wanted that. So they thought that animals had powers. And one of the books that I admired was a Joseph Camel book called The Way of the Animal Powers, which really expressed the way the pre-agricultural people saw our animal cousins. They saw them with respect, with admiration, but always with a sense of continuity and kinship and wanting to be like that, wanting to have, wanting to share those powers. So, which made it emotionally difficult for them to kill them and eat them, which made it necessary for them to have a lot of rituals, a lot of ceremonies. They didn't just go out and kill them mechanically. They had to do stuff, especially- so they, the they did it to make themselves feel better? Yeah, well, basically to diffuse the emotional tension. One anthropologist called it guilt, the guilt that they had of killing creatures that they admired. They, did, they had a, a different view of death than we did. They didn't see death as the end of life. They saw death as just going to another place, living somewhere else, like across the river, so to speak. So they didn't really uh, have terrible amount of grief for the loss of the animal. Another thing they had to do is ask permission for the animal species being hunted. And this is reflected too in animal sacrifice. When the Greeks and the Romans sacrificed an animal, the priest, the, the religious leader who did the killing had to ask those animals for permission to take their lives. And they would say things, and I wrote about this some in the book, the priest had to say something like, I don't want to do this, but the gods want me to do this. The gods want your life as a sacrifice. So I'm sorry, but I have to kill you so that we can have the ceremony. Uh, but even though that seems to us like nonsense and BS, it's something they felt they had to do because of the way they believed the life in the life of these other beings that they were somehow special, they were admirable. So they had to go to some sort of emotional and spiritual gymnastics in order to be able to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, if this is interesting to you, I, you know, we, I don't know what we can do with it as activists, but it does show you that at one time in our existence as humans, we had much better attitudes about our fellow animals, attitude of what I call kinship, of belonging, of, of being a, in a continuum with the other beings on the planet, which is a very healthy way for us to live in as we move into the climate crisis. So I, I'd argued at the end of the book, that the way to recover from our exploitative worldview is to, is to restore and recover this ancient idea of animals as being kinfolks, mm -hmm. of being admirable, of being a part of their lives. And uh, if we were to take that attitude and update it with science so we see the real biological continuity, I mean, evolution, Darwinism, the, the, the progression of the evolution of the animals into human form needs to be understood because that helps us understand how we are related to other animals, how we are a part of them and not separate from them. And then I, I do that a lot. I, I don't know how to translate that into activism. Uh, I hope activists can use some of that information, but that that is real biological proof that we are animals and that we are related to animals, uh, evolutionary, biologically, biochemically. What is it they say that 98.9% of our genetic material we have in common with the uh, the other apes, the chimpanzees. So that's undeniable. It's proven. So let's update 
the idea, the ancient idea of kinship, of admiration for animals with the scientific knowledge of the continuity, evolutionary continuity that we have with them and, and feel a part of living here instead of separate and, you know, and, and aloof and remote from other life on the planet. Oh, gosh, yes. You said a lot that, you know, so I, I'm going to encourage people to buy your book if they haven't already, especially the 2021 version. You know, we we must, we must restore that kinship. It feels necessary for us to have a future as as well as a species yeah. on this planet. And it just, I can feel almost this collective sort of sadness, like, like we must all be grieving that loss subconsciously or cellularly yeah. or something. That's more of a metaphysical, you know, thing. But, but, but we must because they are kin. And to think about them as kin, we're killing our kin. Most of us have fantasies sometimes about killing other people. Not, not that we would do, but we don't have fantasies about killing the people that we love. But all yes. animals are our beloved. Yeah. You know, the fact that we went from revering them, admiring them. And I and, and just like loving them like they are, you know, they're everything, you know, yeah. they're, to to where we are now just, you know, shows us. And I and I don't know about other people, maybe in the chat, you can comment. How do you feel when you're around animals for a few hours? Like really connect with that. Right. Well, I, Not only is it to keep us going as activists, but literally I feel my energy, my whole mindset, everything re-energizes. And I yeah. think that that is part of the mad, the ones that are thriving in, I'm yeah. thinking about when I go to sanctuaries and, and how it is like such a boost and something is going on there. It something, is. Something's happening that, that is tangible. I think you ought to feel that as kinship. I feel that every time I relax with my beloved kitty cat, uh, who's now I think 12 or 13 years old. And I look into her eyes and she purrs, and I sense that there's some kind of messaging between us. It's not verbal. It's not intellectual. It's just that we're feeling the same way at the same time. Mm. She's comforted. I'm comforted. She's purring. I feel relaxed. I feel a tremendous kinship uh, relationship with her when I just am that close and I look into her eyes as I do with this beautiful dog, Lucy. Just look into their eyes sometime, and you'll feel that, and you and you know what they're thinking and feeling. Absolutely, we 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 have the it's it's a blessing, and it's a it's a it. I mean, we don't want to take it for granted. You know, it's very no. very precious these relationships, and they are relationships, no different than any other relationship. You know, we should tr to treasure these warm bodies, these sentient beings, them living with us. It's I it's my greatest joy. There's nothing out, you know, you know, it's so, all right, let me, before I go off. Yeah. Uh, there was something in the chat from Miriam. Oh, she says she asked before, we do not say children cruelty. Uh, so why do we say animal cruelty? Since we say child abuse, we should say animal abuse. That way we know abusing animals, animals life is the same as abusing humans. What do you think? Yeah, it's, uh, they are, there are connections. I mean, they, I think there are plenty of studies of uh, sociopathic criminals to show that they start out torturing animals. I mean, there's a lot of literature on this. Um, that is where they start numbing any kind of sense of empathy or compassion mm -hmm. that you might have. We might have, have been an instinct. I, I, I think I felt that as a farm kid that there was some instinctive, uh, it's kind of a hopeful thing about humanity that before I became cultured into being a farm boy and having to do cruel things to animals when I was four or five years old, I just had an, an automatic emotional connection with animals. I rescued mice from the barn. Um, it hurt me to to see the way they treated the calves on the farm and this and that. I, it bothered me as a really young kid. And that gave me hope. It gives me hope today because I think that's instinct. I don't think humans are terrible animals. I think they have learned to be terrible animals. I think we might be born with compassion, with empathy for other things, children, animals. We tend to like 
their comfort and their put and their and their presence, but somehow that's knocked out of us with this culture of exploitation that tells us, don't be emotional about this, don't give these animals names, don't give them personhood. They're things to be used, and I think that's that carries over into that attitude of the numbing of empathy and compassion carries over into human relations as well, so that you see people cruel to children and cruel to other vulnerable beings. Yeah, absolutely. It's There's a lot here, and I hope it isn't too much intellectual stuff and big words. I think that uh, sometimes it seems uh, too much to try to grasp, but uh, yeah. just take it a bit at a time. It's yeah. uh, It's important to know this. It can get wordy, it can get heady, but yeah, just absorb what you can and leave the rest for now. And I don't think anybody's not following you, Jim. I think everybody's yeah here is up to speed, you know, you know, where you are and and in agreement, you know, for the most part and understanding. And so I think that's really good. It's it's empowering to know, as I've learned in reading all this stuff from my book, that there was a time in prehistory when we had I think really healthy, sane attitudes about the other life on the planet, the other animals, when we admired them, when we respected. I think it's telling that the very first art were the pictures of animals that they admired. That's telling. Another telling thing, too, is that if you read the creation stories of all cultures around the world, even the primitive cultures, the way they explain the beginning of life in the world is that animals came first. Animals were the first beings and the most important beings. And a lot of the ethnographies of uh, Native American peoples, for example, and also in South America, when they look into, into their worldview, the way they explain the tribe and how the tribe came into being, often they explain it that the animals were here first and the animals knew how to do things, how to build fire, how to how to find food. And then when humans came along, they were naked and innocent and vulnerable, and the animals taught them how to live and gave them permission then to live in the world among them. And then it goes on from there. A lot of it, but, but I think it's very important that animals were so important in creation stories around the world, which tells mm -hmm. you that they're very prominent in the minds and the consciousness of human beings. Now, Maybe this is too much intellectual stuff. I don't know. As activists, what you can do with it. But I think you ought to know this, that there was a time, a very long time in our evolution as humans, that we had better attitudes about our other beings, our fellow beings. And uh, somehow animal agriculture comes along and destroys that and teaches us that we're special and they're not. They're just resources for our use. That's the attitude we're trying to leave behind oh. that's what we want to dismantle oh my, it's just insult to injury on top of what we do to them to just steal their identity practically like just exactly. steal their steal their personhood steal their humanity and and it's just i mean it's awful on top of awful on top of awful especially to the most innocent and we say that and and you know it certainly makes me wonder what they're thinking you, you yeah. know about us and i know we can't know entirely and know that we you know there's science certainly there but i'm also <laughs> thinking like spiritually is there karma like you know for this you know it depends what you believe of course is there an afterlife for animals it just i have no answer i have sure. my thoughts yeah. but you know what would that look like and do animals forgive us i mean is there such a thing as forgiveness in their in their understanding and, you know, in their spiritual view, are they unconditionally forgiving of us? And, and, and I, I, maybe the crisis we're in against each other is that we're not forgiving ourselves either because we're doing so much. Yeah. Well, I think those, those of us like myself who have been through a period of being a, a mediator and exploiter uh, in some kind of capacity, whether in, in a job or in my case, uh, brought up on a farm, I, I've had to try to uh, to learn to forgive myself for the stuff I did then when I was um, unaware. You know, I was just a, a victim of the farm culture. 
I didn't have any choice in who my parents were. I didn't have any choice in where I was born. That just that just happened. And I just happened to be born into a, yeah. a racist, misogynist, sexist, exploitative culture. And I'm trying to worm my, I'm just still trying to worm my way out of it. There's a, another expression, worm my way. Uh, I don't know why I said that, but uh, there you go again. Yeah. It's in our vocabulary. It's, it, it, it's I catch myself too. This stuff just comes, you know, I might say someone's, you know, you're eating like a pig. I mean, that's like what, right. Or, you know, till kill two birds with one stone and all of those. There's a the whole uh, passage in the book about animal expressions. Somebody wrote a book about the use of animals to express things. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. turns out, according to this person, we use animals and expressions more than anything in the world. Yeah. And that using an animal in an expression somehow empowers, empowers that expression. Like when you say eating like a pig, it just creates imagery. And so it's a very a powerful expression. But we use animals to do that, just like I said, I've wormed my way. What does that mean? Burrowed through like a worm does. So it's a very uh, uh, powerful use in, in speech. And I've got a whole thing on it in, in that part of the book. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's just so this is so broad a conversation. I know it's it's too much. We have to cut, <laughs> cut it down. For, to people, it's too much so. for a day. It's too much for there's a comment here that Rhonda says, if there is a God, I'm sure God has forgiven you a million times, Jim. That's sweet. Yeah. That's sweet. Um, Miriam says, it's horrible that people equate animals as horrible creatures. Um, so Net Netanyahu seeing animals as such call the people he hates, the Palestinians, animals. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that's you refer yeah. to like, that's the worst insult. It is. It is. Like, like it's if a you compliment. Really, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's used uh, fluidly whenever we want to talk about some heinous human behavior, usually some criminal, like in this case, a genocide. It's just, uh, yeah, to call them animals is uh, telling, isn't it? Yeah. And dishonest. And right. Uh, not fa false. False. Yeah. False and not and all of that. So. Let's see. So, so we have time for maybe another, is it okay, Jim, another question maybe from the chat if someone has. Um, I will ask you, um, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about those early days and some of the original activists um, who were around then. And, and we recently lost, I know you and I touched base, but Karen Davis, yeah, a founder of United Poultry Concerns. And she had been doing what she was doing for so long and her impact is still felt. And she's left an ama amazing legacy for chickens and birds and, you know, all species of animals. And she inspired me and I miss her. And I got to, you know, do some of these work online workshops with her as well. People can check those out. Um, I know that you, you know, knew her, but Karen would talked a bit about anthropomorphism. Can you, yeah. you know, how the, it's both not good and bad, but there's, there's better ways to use anthropomorphism, how similar we are humans and, and sure, non human sure. animals, and, but also we can use it incorrectly and, and project too much human traits onto them. So can you define that? A bit well, the, yeah, anthropomorphism means, um, I think, literally in the de de uh, dictionary, it says attributing human uh, characteristics to animals, like when you know the the Disney cartoons uh, anthropomorphized Mickey Mouse, so that he wore clothes and he talked like a human being. That's classic anthropomorphism, and uh, some of our opponents are. Um, from the exploitative industries, I think that's what we activists are doing, attributing characteristics to animals that, that we have to make them more human. Well, that's biologically dishonest because we know, science knows that pigs, for example, are the most intelligent of all the domestic animals. They have uh, very strong social instincts. They, they love to live in groups. 
They identify differences among each other. Uh, they have a, a pig language of sorts, uh, squeals and grunts. They can communicate with each other. They have a whole world of living as pigs that we don't recognize because we can't afford to emotionally if we want to turn them into ham and bacon. Yeah. There's no way that the exploiters want to think of pigs as having lives of value and capacities that we share with them, sensitivity, joy, pain, hunger. And we know as a matter of fact, biological fact, that pigs do share a lot of things that we value in our own human lives. And that's what we are trying. That's not what we are trying to do. It's what the industries are trying to separate that. Humans over here, animals over here, no continuity, no similarities. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep showing them that pigs have lives of value and that they're worth more. And this is where Karen Davis was so effective. She was never afraid to speak out, no matter what the forum, no matter what the audience. Karen Davis had a way of, she didn't care what people thought about her. She just told it like it was or is. And she seemed harsh and she seemed extreme and she seemed wacko to a lot of people. But boy, she kept doing it until she got through to them. Yeah. So she didn't care if people liked her. She was, yeah. she was direct, but she also had the goods to back it up and the Yeah. So as activists, you know, you have to look at her behavior sometimes uh, critically because she just was unembarrassed, unashamed to come out and say it. I hope right. she can. I hope she can hear us talking about her and that she's with sure. her. Sure, sure. You know, but talk about. I I had this image of her being met by all the animals she helped to save. That sure endless line to greet her. You know, on the other side, I would love to think that that is true. But uh, so where someone is asking in the comments or in the in the chat here, if you can, we'll, we're going to wrap up in a bit. Can you give us a an action? A, an actionable uh, st strategy and and you know do you think it's wise for us to know some facts like you have you pull the facts like how effective is it to talk facts talk history obviously you wrote the book because you sure. want to be armed with facts and history and origins and the roots but what can right. what can you live us with like what we can start to do as activists right away well um put the vegan and <laughs> In the, in, the, in the A box, in the number one box. And that being vegan, there's more to it than a diet. It's not just a food choice, as, as good vegans know. It, you know, it's it's not for our health, you know, or nutrition. It's, being vegan is a lot more, more to it than finding vegan food in vegan restaurants. And uh, so just, um, I would say, uh, be vegan, but an expanded vegan there's more to it than just what's on your plate and how you find food it's uh, has to do with the whole sort of a renovation or a rehabilitation of our attitudes about animals and most vegans i know that are activists already are doing this mm -hmm. uh it's not news that we should be doing this thinking differently about animals and our place in the world with respect to animals. And as we're trying to point out, it's relationship of kinship, of biological continuity. We are animals. They are like us. We are like them. There's a lot among us that we share, including feelings, and in some cases, diseases. So that's why we have COVID now. I keep trying to tell people around here because we have too many chickens in the world. We share respiratory diseases with birds, especially farmed birds, chickens and turkeys and ducks and so forth. They're a huge, the, the factory farm chickens of the world are a huge reservoir for respiratory pathogens that affect us. Just another piece of activism there to tell people we need to phase that out. It's not good for our health not only to eat them, but to have so many of them, you know, harboring all these organisms. So there's expanded veganism, I would say, is looking at all the ramifications of the choices that we make on our plate and how that affects the world 
how animals are raised, what those animals are actually like in their lives. Those pigs in those factory farms, think about what kind of animals they are if they weren't in those factory farms. What is the life of a pig supposed to be like in, in a non-factory farm setting? They have a place in nature. And I think there are pigs, just uh, are pig-like pig relatives. Um, what do they call them? Um, wild swine. boars? They... Swine. Yeah, wild oh, boars. Swine. Okay. In, every, in every part of the world. They're in Europe. They're in Asia. Uh, every every continent has some kind of a pig. I think maybe Australia doesn't, but they're they're like uh, canids, like wolves and dogs. They're everywhere around the world, and somehow we've captured a few of them and 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 using genetically uh, genetically altered them. Yeah, animal domestication has reduced them to these poor things in factory farms. So, but expanded veganism would be really what are pigs and what are they like and where do they belong? And the same with all the other creatures we call livestock. That's cattle. That's horses. What is their natural environment? Did you, do you realize that all the farmed animals that we know still have their wild, their free ancestor is still in its natural habitat mm. with the exception of one live, uh, barnyard animal, cattle. Cattle have been wiped out. But every other horses, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, everything, every other barnyard animal has its wild ancestor still in mm. place somewhere yeah, on the planet. Somewhere on the in planet. the world. Yeah. So when they when they tease us about phasing out animal agriculture, they say, oh, what will happen to all of these animals? Well, for one thing, we quit breeding them into exploitative situations, and we try to allow them to have a habitat as some places in Europe are doing. I think in Spain, they're trying to restore uh, what's left of some of the wild cattle. They don't have the original stock, but they have the closest animals to them. So they're trying to provide space, habitat, and the same with wolves and some of the other animals. I think in Asia, uh, in, in Mongolia, they're trying to establish a preserve for the wild horses who are the ancestors, all horses that we have today. Mm. And that's that's part of a movement, I think, is to show where these animals belong and provide places for them. I love that. So get really, really good, you're saying, and edu educate yourself on unique the uniqueness of animals and and talk about it and get really comfortable talking about it. And sure. Keep sure. the animals, keep the conversation off humans as much as possible and keep the conversation about animals and how friggin' amazing. This, they are um, front. Michelle, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this this effort is called rewilding. And some of some of you could look um, that up. There's quite a, 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 a parts of a movement in Europe to rewild parts of um, the countries in Europe where they can bring back these. Uh, animals near extinction mm. and some of them are like uh, the original sheep and goats and they're trying to preserve their spaces wow, wow. rewilding rewilding Rewilding. Yeah, it rings a bell i don't know if other folks have heard about that yeah but i know we want to wrap up and and you know we said this is a hopeful conversation so to sort yeah. of end on a you've given us a lot of hope but to, to end on a hopeful note i know I don't know if folks have read that AI, artificial intelligence, made a prediction that there'll be a mostly vegan world. I think they said like 2050 something. I don't know if I remember yeah. bring that correctly. Did you hear that? And do you? I did hear that. I mean, it's it... not soon enough. It's not soon enough. So maybe it's not that hopeful, but it is if there's a prediction. Well, a hopeful thing too on AI, somebody has invented a, a way to, 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 to interpret the language of pigs. To be able to, oh my speak. god, yeah, yeah, to wow. to use. I think they, they. I wish I had a better explanation of what I read, but it was uh, somebody has done a a documentary or a, a a visual that shows using AI to interpret pig language. So that what are they can, saying? Do they say what the, communication? What's the so that we can understand what pigs are trying to say. With I their want blood, to know right now. With their grunts and squeals and their body language. And it can be interpreted as saying, I'm I'm too hot, I'm too cold or whatever. Well, we know with sign language, 
with chimps, it's already been done mm, uh, with right. chimps and gorillas. So, yeah, to be able to actually have the animals tell us what's going on with them. They are trying to tell us, for God's sakes, and we need to stop expecting them to speak like us and, and learn how to speak like them and know what they're saying. Wouldn't that potentially change things drastically? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so this may be too much here for people, but it just just trying to show you what we're a part of here. We're a part of something. <laughs> it's so big, you know, and it's so important to, in an age when the whole world is in a state of anxiety over the climate crisis. It's common knowledge now that we're kind of doomed if we don't change our ways. You know, there's too many of us and we use too much of the planet for our own pleasure. So absolutely, we've got to dismantle human supremacy, speciesism, animal exploitation is just bad for us. Bad in every way. Bad for the environment. Bad for us spiritually. Um, it's got to go. And we are the people who are tackling that. And um, to give you hope, you're part of an international effort. There's people like you all over the planet trying to make these changes. Happening right now as we speak. Right. And the fact that th these folks are here and you and I are here says something you know, that hopefully we're steering the ship, the course of our future away from dystopia, <laughs> to yeah. something more positive and hopeful. And so to know that our animal friends, our animal cousins are integral to part of this, Jim, thank you ever, ever so much for everything you, you have shared and for the books that you've written and the work that you've done. And I know that people can find you on, on X, which used to be known as Twitter, <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. They can find you there uh, in terms of social media and they can just Google you, for, you know, for your books and, and for other things. So let me wrap up uh, with just a few AAM announcements. Like, for example, our next program is January 25th coming up. Uh, that's going to be on infighting and, and conflict resolution for activists specifically within our movement. February 6th, I'm going to have a conversation like this with the one and only vegan Evan, uh, who became an activist around age five and hasn't stopped yet. And I think he's 13 or 14 now, an incredible young man, an incredible inspiration. So that's February 6th and more, more programs to come. So please, please, please check out our previous workshops. Binge watch all of them here on our YouTube channel and subscribe. That really helps us out. Follow us on social media. That really helps us out. And that's it. Thank you again, Jim. Thank you all for being here for the tireless work you're doing for the animals. If you're interested in becoming an AAM mentor or mentee or want to volunteer with us or to get involved in some way or to donate, um, visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. And until we meet again, stay strong, everyone, and live vegan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, Michelle. Bye, Jim.